Welcome to the Roundtable Consult. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Williams, and I'm joined, as always, by my ever-evolving cousin and co-host, <laughs> attorney Sonia Madison. How you doing? It's so nice to see you struggle <laughs> with making glowing remarks every Saturday. It's 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 a struggle. <laughs> it's a hard thing. You know, I mean, we've been doing this show now for five seasons now. It's hard to come up with something nice to say about you. But, but the Lord inspires me. He moves me and he says, you know, think on these things. Whatsoever things are just kind, a good report. Think on these things. And Sonia never comes up in that. <laughs> you sound like these MAGA cults when you have a candidate that is a prosecutor, she's a senator, she's the vice president, and yet I have so hard figuring out why she's qualified. <laughs> <laughs> right. She's not qualified. I'm like, really? really? Are you serious? It's like, what does a woman have to do? I mean. <laughs> uh oh. Grow different genitalia, apparently. So. <laughs> Interesting enough, this is it's been an interesting week. Um, because again, break, breaking off from last week, I mean, it was still tough because you see her do 60 Minutes, you see her do um, the Call Her Daddy podcast, you see her do The View, yeah. and yet, <laughs> yet everyone is still like, mm, not enough, she needs to be out there more. Well, I will say, maybe it's sometimes too little too late, because <clears throat> once you've already had the, the criticism, and you know, I think it was, first, per, personally, I think it was a, a, a brilliant strategy, go to the people, get to the people, you had a short time to do your campaign, um, immediately get out to the people, let the people see who you are, and then start doing the media tours. Um, brush up a little bit, bone up, because as a presidential candidate, you can't just, you know, people when they're in their early stages of their candidacy, they make mistakes. They 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 fumble on certain things. And so she had to bone up a little bit before she got to some of the hard hitting interviews. I mean, you say that, I just feel like she's been out there constantly. I mean, she's done town homes constantly. She's doing rallies constantly. She has been on other podcasts constantly. Um, and if she has a lot of surrogates out there that are also out constantly. And she's also still the vice president of the United States. And we are going through a catastrophe in the past two weeks with two hurricanes. Yeah. And so if it isn't the criticism of, oh, she's been doing interviews, it's the, oh, she's not doing her job. It's the, oh, look at her policies when, again, she's not the president, she's the vice president. Well, oh, why did she do this during her um, administration? I mean, it's, it's a never, I feel like the goalpost just continues to move, um, just depending on the day, the minute, the hour. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, as soon as he checks something off the list, oh, well, we've moved that goalpost now. Now you have to do this. <laughs> yeah, well. Can't, can't win for losing. Welcome to life of femininity. <laughs> the black woman, the plight of a black woman. Black, the plight of a black woman. <laughs> now, that sounds like the title of a book. You should write that, Sonia. Light of a black woman. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't know if you, um, Trevor Noah's got a children's book coming out, but he was on The View. And one of the, host asked him about, you know, you seem to tell people if if they want to know how to get something done, particularly as it relates to how to correct certain injustices or oppress oppression, go to a Black woman. And he said, well, let me be clear. I I'm not saying one person is going to be able to solve it all. <laughs> but as a collective, you can see historically, as well as the fact that they pretty much are, as Malcolm X said, the lowest protected group. Um, they often have the most, I guess, cognitive ability to tell you some of the things that can be done. Yes. And I, just wish... oh, oh, I like the way you put that, the cognitive ability. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish so many people... Basically, they can give you a piece of their mind, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to give you a look without cussing you out. But, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but, no, but they also, again, they, I just wish more people would listen. But I've seen a lot of people... Um, for a lot of black women lately are on the ballots um just yeah. across the the nation it seemed for a period of time black women were ruling for a little bit and, i don't know about you women know, You're taking a little time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know actually um you know this has been pretty tragic what's been going on down in florida though i, I did want to you know acknowledge the, the 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 tragedies that have been uh hitting that area for whatever reason in my gut i think we got one more coming 
and and I hate to say that, but I really don't want to see it happen again. But it's I just it's thinking that man, the, the amount of devastation that just keeps happening um, of historic proportions. You have to think that there's some cause for that. And to Marjorie Taylor Greene and other kooks out there, no, it's not that the government is controlling the weather and destroying the, the lives Democrat, of people. Yeah. Huh? the democrats yeah the democrats yeah <laughs> the democrats aren't controlling the weather and you know intentionally targeting republican areas now if you think that republican areas are being specifically targeted maybe it's got so i shouldn't say that. <laughs> like back when the aids argument <laughs> But you know, it's it's interesting on that because I mean, again, I agree. She's she's one of your representatives over there, and no, actually, she's Georgia, isn't she? Oh, great. she's Georgia. She's <laughs> one of yours. I was about to say, you talking to yourself or what? I know you're right, and and we've got a great guy running against her. Hopefully, you guys in that district will vote for him. Um, but we and and again, it's a coup. We can't control the weather, but is there a control over prevention? Because if if climate change is the reason why this is happening. And we're ignoring it in terms of putting in any measures in place to help combat it. Then it, you know, are we inviting it? I don't know that you can actually stop it. Truth be told, and maybe maybe we're too far behind the eight ball. That same situation with Kamala and her press, her press tour. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that when you start too late, it's kind of hard <laughs> to stop the motion that has already been placed, uh, that had already started. Um, but certain there are some things that you can do to slow its course, I think. And we unfortunately are too selfish of a people to want to do anything that helps and benefit mankind. That's too much like altruism and we wouldn't do that as a people. Um, and, you know, that's not me judging other people because in my neighborhood, you have to pay to recycle. And oh, as wow. a result, yeah, I know, you know, <laughs> so I don't recycle. I was like, I'm going to recycle it into the ground when the trash people come up. And that is my own selfishness. And so this is an indictment, not just on other people, but by, by no means am, am I getting on a soapbox. It's just that there are certain things that we determine that are inconvenient, too inconvenient to our lifestyles, too inconvenient to our budgets. Uh, to our preferences, whatever it is, and even to our liberties, some people would think, to actually do something self-sacrificial to help the environment and help other people survive. I think it's just human nature. Well, I do think human nature is to be selfish, and that's why we need Christ, right? Because our human nature is of sin. Um, we need the right Christ, <laughs> right. <laughs> not that evangelical Christ, <laughs> not the white yeah. Jesus with the wavy hair. <laughs> and of course, there is there is some irony in that some of the representatives that voted against FEMA are claiming that <laughs> hey, there's not enough money in the budget to help with some of these catastrophes, even though they still won't come back um, in session. So more money, because it sounds like President Biden probably feels the way you feel. Is it well, one, we, we still haven't assessed what the total damage is, but two, it, it could still be another, you know, horrific event coming. And if we barely got enough money to handle what, what has happened so far, then we're not going to be prepared for what's going on. The other tragedy is, is that a lot of insurance companies are saying we're no longer insuring properties in Florida. And even if they are insuring them, they're um the, the, the premiums are just like through the roof. And I, and I start watching it. And this is one thing that I've been observing recently. And that is when there's a confluence of economic uh, burdens that are brought on a country, I don't, I wonder how much can you actually sustain? And you got, right now you got the Ukraine war where it's sending billions of dollars over to help assist them. And then you got the, you know, the Gaza war. Uh, between Israel and now Hezbollah and, and soon Iran. Well, actually, Iran now, basically, all of these things. Uh, and so we, we're, we've got all these allies that we have committed to, and I think rightfully so, to help protect. But then when all of our 
allies are not all of them, but a substantial number of our allies are engaged in very expensive and enduring battles that produces a financial strain on us as Americans. And we continue to um, put forth, you know, more money. And then we get hit with a couple of nat natural disasters in our own area and it becomes even more difficult. And right now we've been trying to fight off a recession. And I think Joe Biden has done a good job, or at least this administration, I won't give him credit for it, but this administration, if you're the president during that administration, you get the, you get the credit or the blame. Like president, not vice president, president. <laughs> exactly. You get, the, you get the credit or the blame. And so at least we've staved off a recession for, for right now. But I just wonder what happens when, um, another country introduces a virus. Maybe another country, maybe it just happens naturally. What happens when another virus is introduced into our communities that starts disabling people? Because people will not isolate. People will not, the government will not shut down. People will not wear masks. And a lot of them will not get vaccinated. And so as a result, many of them will die. And the workforce is further depleted. The workforce for us right now is already very much depleted because you get everything on back order. I'm operating in the hospitals and I can't get IV fluids. You're like, well, what do you mean you can't get IV fluids? We're having to cancel surgeries because there's a shortage on IV fluid. What is it? It's salt water. It's salt water. Why would you have a shortage of salt water? But the problem is not the shortage of supplies or materials. It's a shortage of manpower. And so you've got all of these disasters and wars that are consuming um, expenses, and then you introduce into there a worker shortage. It then fuels more economic decline and hardship. And once we get to a certain point where it's so bad of economic hardship, crime goes up. And we'll start seeing this happen over and over again. I'm not sure that there's a way to actually stop all of that. Um, it's just things are in motion and they're just going to happen the way that they're going to happen. And if another, if another hurricane hits Florida this year, it will be absolutely devastating to us, I think, as a country. Well, based on your words, I can tell you weren't too happy when you heard President Biden send over COVID machines to Russia. Or to oh, not Biden, Trump. No, Trump. Yes. Thank, Trump, thank you for Trump. correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> Then over those COVID machines um, uh, over to Russia. It, it's interesting because I, I was getting my hair done and um, the the stylist is, you. She I could tell she was pro-Trump, which shocked me beyond. <laughs> <laughs> and she does black hair? <laughs> <laughs> she, she tells me she's like, I, I'm be selective who I talk to about. Um, but she was asking me, which, which spectrum do you think you're on? You think you're a socialist? You think you're a communist? You think you're a fascist? You think you're a capitalist? And she I, asked you that? And gave oh. me the chart so I could understand how each of them are defined in case I needed wow. it. And I said, <laughs> this is probably going to shock you, but when it comes to government, I am a socialist. I mean, that's, I just think that's what the government is there for. It's not to be a for-profit organization. It is is, is to be um, for, for social pro policies, as well as, of course, to deal with foreign um, foreign entities and the like. But I think that for for the most part, people in this world really want everything to be capitalist, not recognizing that, as you've kind of articulated, there will be a gap and there will be people without. And that will hurt you even if you are the people with. But you're so consumed by your selfishness that you don't care mm -hmm. <laughs> um, about what's going on with them. So long, so long as you can continue to, again, have the survival of the fittest mentality, you can, you can continue to still feel entitled. And and again, we've talked about this before, but it really goes back to the movie origin and, and the idea of every government ha feels like they have to have a caste system. I feel like they still, they even though, and we see this a lot with um, poor white people, even though at the, they, they know they so economically at the bottom, they still want to be able to be entitled to be above the, the black person or a mm -hmm. minority. And so it, it's one thing to try to tackle the economy, tackle some of these um, economic problems when you also still have to tackle the entitlement mentality 
of, of people because they still, even these programs that are ideally supposed to be for helping small businesses or, or helping a, social, a certain group, those programs are still often going to big corporations <laughs> and, and people who are, are still wealthy, um, even absent of them. And so I don't doubt Trump probably could tell, probably could say, oh, I use so many programs despite having $200 million at least in a trust fund. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I heard that there's been reports that during his time as presidency, he diverted at least one billion dollars to various businesses. So again, you're you're you recognize, man, these lobbyists, yeah, they're they're putting it out as programs for the the, the disadvantage, but it's still the advantage that they use them. Yeah. I'm I'm convinced that you know, most people don't really know what socialism, communism and capitalism really is. Uh, I'm surprised that she actually she gave you the definitions of it. <laughs> she was surprised when she was like, oh, I guess we need to stop talking. I was like, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? That ended the conversation? <laughs> he thought I was going to say cap. I'm sure a lot of people probably say capitalism. And I'm like, no, I mean, again, for my personal life, yeah. But even then, if I know about a lot of these programs and I have the access to them, I'm going to use them. Right. <laughs> of course. That's what that's what they're there for. You know, I always find it ironic that people think that the government should be out of your business until it's a matter that's important to them. Whether it's, you know, whether it's um abortion laws, anti abortion laws. Well, why why is the government in your business then? It's acceptable to do it then. Or whether it's and especially when it comes to dealing with some of your money. In the allocation of your money, but when you need the money, then you always want the government to be there. It's uh, it's interesting. So I guess for the purpose of our um, viewing audience, I want to basically try to break down with my limited knowledge of economics <laughs> what what uh, the difference is between the socialism, capitalism, and and um, <clears throat> what's the other one? Do communism? Communism. And I want you to also bring up fascists. Well, I'm, I'm have to, I'm gonna have to let you define fascism because I'm, I'm not, I'm not so keen on fascism. Hey, but. hey that's where we're headed. But go ahead. You, you the first <laughs> so we start thinking about economic terms. Economic terms within any economy, there has to be a means of production. How does an economy produce goods and services and deliver them in a fashion that it produces an income? And so in capitalism, those the, the means of production are owned by private citizens or corporations, which means that, you know, that means that they depend heavily on workers in order to be able to uh, to fuel that machine. And so when, what's supposed to happen in a capitalistic society when it works well is that the workers generate a product it, or service, it goes to consumers, money is generated, the owners of that production then take that money and reinvest it into the more production and also compensate fairly those persons who help produce it. But the problem with capitalism, however, is that, you know, money is a difficult thing to, to part with. You know, when you start getting more money and you get used to having more money, you become a little bit more and more greedy about it. Socialism, however, is then means that the community owns the means of production. And, and that the purpose of that means of production, this is my very colloquial and very elementary description of it. Again, I'm not an economist. So if anybody's an economist, you're certainly welcome to chime in and correct me if I'm wrong. But the community owns the means of production. And that means that when there's a profit produced, the community benefits from it. And I still don't understand why that's a, where the where, where there's a problem with that because the the community then makes sure that everyone in the community is cared for. Communism means that the government owns the means of production and then it distributes the resources how it sees fit. Now I think people confuse the economic systems with the governmental systems. And you can have a governmental system different from, uh, that can be authoritarian, it could be democratic, it could be republic, it could be theocratic, whatever it is, uh, you can still attach 
an economic system to that governmental system. And that governmental system, if it's corrupt, then the economic system will also be corrupt. Regardless, uh, none of these economic systems are immune to corruption if you have a corrupt leader and a, a corrupt government. For example, capitalism, we think that capitalism is so immune to corruption, but the reality of it is, is that in a democracy, like such as what we have, what happens is that oligarchs or people who actually contain a lot of, who actually have a lot of money, a lot of wealth, they can donate money and, and finances to campaigns, and they can basically install in office who they want to be in office. And the ones that they will install will be those who are going to have favorable policies toward their uh, economic prosperity of the company, not necessarily the workers, but of the companies. And so you see people like Elon Musk pouring millions and millions of dollars into Donald Trump because he expects to get another return. This past week, he was, uh, I think, with Tucker Carlson. He said, he said, you know, if if Trump lose, I'm effed. You know, because he went all out Put that for in an it. Ad. Huh? Put that in the ad. You're right. <laughs> it's like, I'm F because I went all out for him. But that's not the way that democracy should work. But if you have a corrupt government, then yeah, you can do that. People always look at socialist countries like Venezuela and they use that as a uh, as an example. Do you want to be like Venezuela and Cuba? You know, there's so that's socialism. No, the problem is not socialism. The problem is authoritarianism. And that's what people fail to look at, is that if you have an authoritarian, regardless of what what system, economic system you have, the authoritarian is going to be the one that determines how the people are oppressed. And, and, that's, so per fascism. and that's fascism. It is, uh, that is an authoritarian, ultranationalist, movement party, dictator type government. That's fascism. And so they're going to direct the money however they need to direct it. But if I think from a biblical standpoint, you know, we look in the Bible and the New Testament, particularly the New Testament church, that was a socialist system. Well, look but, in the Old Testament when they were begging for a king and he was begging them, no, I'm, I know what's best for you. You don't need a king because a king will be corrupt. It will be about him and it will change the, the course by which, you know, you guys need to recognize you're all chosen people. You're all here. For the service of just God, and you're all equal in that in that realm. But if you get a king, it will change that. And then we saw it play out in real time in the Old Testament because He gave them the king, and we saw what happened by the end of the Old Testament. Yeah, I mean, there were some kings that were good kings, but then there were others that were evil kings, and the vast majority of them did not do what was right <laughs> in the sight the of the best of the good kings. Because even David, the best of the good kings, still help this still does not help the the good of everyone um because yeah. even when we saw with david he he not only had so many wives and concubines but then he killed someone just so he could marry one of his wives and well, i mean you know she's that good <laughs> i mean she's that beautiful oh my god that masculinity thing that you guys think is <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, I just think even the best of a person still, you, you you still can't expect that will still bring the best of of everyone's interest. Yeah, well, so the 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 scripture even in the Old Testament it starts talking about how you actually care for the poor. I think I'm blanking on which scripture it is, but it talked about when you reap your fields, don't reap all the way to the edge. Leave some of it there for the poor and for the foreigner who comes through so that they can get that. That's a socialist mentality. Uh, when we talk about the book of Acts and and they said all the people had all things in common and uh, and nobody had a need for anything. The reason why is because people sold their houses, sold all their possessions and they came to um, came together so that the community could all have everything that they need. That's socialism. When the rich man came to Jesus and said, <clears throat> you know, master or, or rabbi, I've kept the law all my life and never departed from it. He's like, what do I need to do to be in, in, enter into the kingdom? Jesus said, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. That's socialism. That's making sure that everybody in your communities, not just in your communities, but the surrounding areas around your community has what they need to survive. I'm convinced that there's enough 
resources and enough wealth in this country, and not just in this country, but in this world, so that nobody in this world should have to go without food or without clothes. They should be destitute. But it requires, in order for socialism to work, it requires at its core some level of altruism. And that's the only system that I'm aware of, only economic system that I can think of that actually requires a level of altruism. Capitalism certainly doesn't. Capitalism focuses mostly on selfishness uh, of the people at the top. Communism doesn't. Communism really basically just depends on the government and a, a small group of people determining, you know, who gets what. And often that's going to be corrupted as well. And so I, 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 when I look at the biblical examples of capitalism versus socialism, I'm dumbfounded by why, you know, socialism is often vilified. Now, don't get me wrong. I've benefited greatly from capitalism. My personally, I have benefited. You're a socialist person, the policy to help me out. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I think it's right. I don't, doesn't mean that I think it's the ideal system um, because I know Kamala has gotten criticized recently. People are like, you know, she's a Marxist. She's a communist. That's where they all come. You know, it's coming from Trump. I mean, we could probably play a steal of all the names he calls her. And I'm sure Marxist is one of them. Yeah. <laughs> but, but so I'm like, why do people get so upset when they start talking about Karl Marx? I get it. Mar Karl Marx and his belief, he was a, uh, was he an economist or philosopher? I don't know what he was. I think he was an economist, but he, criticized uh, capitalism. He said capitalism depends on two classes, the bourgeoisie, which are the people, the rich folk. And it's just it's where bougie came from, <laughs> the bourgeoisie and uh, the proletariat. The proletariat were the workers. And this, he, was, he was postulating that the bourgeoisie will exploit the proletariat, the workers, uh, to gain more and more wealth. And eventually the workers will, become, will grow tired of that and they start recognizing their true worth and that they would rebel against it. And when they rebel against it, he expected a huge clash or conflict between the two classes. And what it eventually would do is devolve into socialism and eventually capitalism, I mean, and eventually communism. So he believed that the end result was communism. And so that's why everybody, if you, if you even quote Karl Marx, and I'll probably be called a communist just by even just defining what he believed. <laughs> if you or actually, you saying that she's being critical <laughs> for having a, a similar philosophy or, or you know, yeah, ideology. Yeah, that's it's it's crazy uh, that people you know, will say. And it's if, also crazy because I do think people like to ignore the cultural differences of of others. I mean, is it really? Do you, are you really ever surprised when someone who is from um, a marginalized community or a certain little economic class is going to have a different philosophical or even economical viewpoint than like someone like the Prince of Wales or, <laughs> or even a Donald Trump. I mean, are we really surprised in that? But yet we are so quick to name call, not trying to hear, well, clearly you have a different um, upbringing, a different perspective of the world than me and my privileged state. And I mean, I just find that always interesting how, again, it's because to me, then it's just going to morph into you know, racism, xenophobia. It just morphs into that. Classism. Yeah, <laughs> all of it, you know, <laughs> and and hopefully, you know, it's not as many people in marginalized communities in the upper economic class. So that's why I say it, it still eventually goes in. But, but even when you talk to oftentimes um, rich Black people, um, you you see there's some, sometimes they're torn because they still understand unless they are famous, you are easily going to be lumped in with the with with other black people, particularly the stereotype that people have, rich people have of certain marginalized communities. Yeah, I it it's interesting. It would be interesting to to know why people just ignore the perspective of other people and I, and, and people grow tired of that i get it Karl marx was right you know as a work as a worker you grow tired of it. i was talking to a friend earlier this week and i said 
at the hospital when we're dealing with the shortage of supplies. Of salt the, water. <laughs> salt water, right. <laughs> I say like, the real reason is, is that people, I blame the gig economy. And I think what's happened, I don't blame the gig economy, but I think when COVID happened, it showed people that I don't have to depend on the bourgeoisie for my income. I found other ways to do it. And when I say gig economy, I might be misusing the word, but uh, where people become self-employed and they become the masters of their own economic fate. And so what they've done is you got people who are now driving for Uber and Lyft. You got so they they don't depend on the the bourgeoisie. They don't depend on corporate for income. You got people who are now making money on advertising on YouTube and TikTok. Influencers, yeah. Influencers. Yeah. yeah. They're finding ways. <laughs> you've got you've got uh musicians and creatives who are now saying I don't need the big record labels and other big publishers to actually release my book. All I can do all of this stuff myself and I don't have to get super rich doing it, but I can make enough money doing my own thing on my own time the way that I want to do it without being told by the man, when I say the man, I'm not just talking about the white man, whatever the man is, that that the boss, basically, the one who would control my hours for working, the one who would control uh, my, my wage earning capacity, all of these people. And so those people have left the workforce, uh, the, the, the corporate workforce, if you want to call it that. And they've become entrepreneurs. And as entrepreneurs, they're not dependent on, you know, the means of production owned by a small group of wealthy people. And as a result, I think what's happening now, you're starting to see some of these other corporations start realizing that, hey, we need to fix this somehow. I was telling them, I said, the way that my fix to it is I have to have employees. <laughs> I was going to say that only works for certain because you don't you don't want everyone thinking WebMD is really the same as asking a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but AI might be. AI is so I was going to say, though, you know, I don't know if too many employers are are missing that because they are using a lot more AI. Um, and I'm seeing a lot more layoffs. Um, and I think that's why when we look even at the unions, I think that's why a lot of people are critical of them. And that's partly probably why a lot of Republicans don't even try to to target them as a, as a potential you know, ally, because they are seeing the shift from, hey, I don't, corporations don't necessarily want to collectively bargain with employees, <laughs> particularly if, you know, they want to have the option to, again, as AI continues to do well, have mass layoffs without, yeah. again, bargaining. But, but here's the deal. And so I was telling that friend, I said, so that means I have to find other ways because I can't compensate my employees enough to stay with me. I have to give them other incentives to want to stay. And so I have to be a great boss. I have to provide a great place to work. <laughs> I have and to be a good person. <laughs> I do. Don't I, think even, it is natural for Mark. He, even, he when I, even, <laughs> even when I don't want to be, it does usually come natural. But even when I don't want to be, I have to also be cognizant of how I treat people. And I like that because what's happened is that too often the wealthy have felt like I don't have to pay attention to how I treat you because you need me. And now people are saying, no, we don't need you, Mr. Bourgeoisie. We don't need you because we can do this on our own. And I, unfortunately, the backlash to that would be after people have started finding out, hey, I can do a lot of things on my own. The backlash is going to be a worker shortage. And because there's a worker shortage, it creates an opportunity for AI. And not a, no, wait a minute, one step before that. Because we live in a capitalistic society, when there's a worker shortage, wages go up. People are saying, listen, I know you need employees, so you're going to have to compensate me much more in order to um, to be able to do this. So, yeah. So you say wages are now going up. My expenses are going up. My profit is going down. If you got huge profits and you can spare that, then, you know, the reality is, is a lot of shareholders in these corporations aren't going for that because they're going to move on to the next one. And that that business will crumble. But for small business owners and other things like that, you say, well, increased wages could be devastating to my business. And I'm one of those people. If I had to pay each one of my employees, you know, a minimum wage of $20 or $25, I would close my doors. 
And so now it creates an opportunity to say, how else can I substitute? And for me, I want to put it out there. <laughs> I'm going to put it out there. I hire employees who live in the Philippines right now to answer phones and do things that I need to. You or Trump. Because huh? Trump hired China to go make those Bibles. So you and Trump just... <laughs> well, well, here's the reality. The reality is, is that there's a worker shortage. One, I can't get the people to work. And two, those that I can get to work want an exorbitant amount of money and don't really put put in the effort for it. We'll be so like now, and blame immigrant immigrants. I wish we would give the immigrants a job. <laughs> I need we need to put them to work. Be like JD Vance and blame immigrants because that's that's exactly again what was going on in Ohio. Corporations were not able to fill those positions with the people there. And so they went and recruited immigrants who were willing to do the job. I will say though, I, I agree to in a certain extent because I do think as again the cost of goods and as the economy continues to be up. I think it's more so people doing two or three jobs than just focused on one. Like if if, if we had a, an economy probably back in 2008 um, and we weren't going through a recession, I, I would definitely hear what you're saying and, and be like, yeah, this could be an issue. But because, I mean, even though the economy has gone down, I want to make sure that's clear because I I hear all these Republicans say, oh, it's trash. No, the, the, the inflation has gone down. Inflation has gone down. But nonetheless, you you do talk to a lot of people and they're still doing multiple jobs. I don't think it's back to our parents' generation where they did that one job, stuck with it, got their pension, whatever. And then and when it was enough to to sustain a household. I think now you've got households with multiple sources of income. That's true. The people who are still working for other people are, you know, requiring two and three jobs. I, I, I hate to say it. <laughs> some of my employees have to work two or three jobs i was gonna say i don't think an uber driver i don't think that's their sole source <laughs> i'm pretty <laughs> sure they're probably doing something else and even if you're trying to be an influencer i mean when it first started yeah it might have been a little easier for you but now there's an abundance of people trying to do that so it's not as likely to be as as profitable um as it was when it initially came out yeah but when you got um when you have options, you, people will assume those options and then they take the the current position that they have a little less uh, seriously. When there were only a couple of good jobs that were available for Black folks and that was going to be working in a factory, you showed up every day on time and you did your darndest in that job to not get fired because you knew that your livelihood depended on you getting in a paycheck from that job. And that if you lost that job, there weren't very many other opportunities available for you. With the unemployment rate being so low right now, there are plenty of opportunities for me. If I don't treat my employees right, they could in a heartbeat just leave and they can go find another job and probably find another job making more money. It probably won't find another job with a more pleasant boss <laughs> than, it, <laughs> than they currently the have. Quality of work has gone down, but I mean, I I think you will still, if if you're saying, "Hey, I'm not going to be able to find workers," the workers will be there. But now, the quality of work, your ability to be competitive to get the best talent, yeah, that's going to be tough. <laughs> yeah. And so, in that environment, guess what? It creates an opportunity for technology to come in. And, oh, and, don't don't fool people to think that it's, it's not already here. It's already here. It's in. here. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. But 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 what's happening is that they're expect I envision this. There's no reason why um AI couldn't answer my phones, talk to a patient very professionally, and route them to the place that they need to go very effectively. Um, they can actually schedule the appointment. If someone called my office. They could talk to an AI bot and say, I'd like to schedule an appointment to see the doctor. And then you could AI can go through a list of questions. What insurance do you have? What's your date of birth? Get all this information and enter it into my computer. Would you prefer a day, a morning or afternoon appointment? What day of the week works best for you? They can ask all these questions. In the meantime, it can be searching my schedule and say, okay, I've got this appointment on this date at this time with this provider. Would that work for you? Yes, it will. I'm going to book you for this appointment. Make sure on the day of the appointment to bring X, Y, or Z, you'll receive a notification about this. It will tell you everything that I want my employees to tell that patient and then get off the phone. And guess what? I can have 30 people, 
30 AI bots doing that at one, I can have limitless number of AI bots doing that at one time and never miss a call. If I have right, I have right now, I have two people who primarily answer calls for scheduling. And then I've got like three other people available for rollover and I still miss calls. But with the AI bot, and not only do I still miss calls, but even some of the information that is required of them is that I ask, pay, ask my employees to collect from patients who call in and or to inform patients about before they schedule an appointment. It's still entered wrong. But AI can do it through the work of 550 employees more efficiently, more accurately. I was going to say, and I think we're all familiar with that. And like, if you're me, I'm going online and booking my appointment. <laughs> yeah. or, or again, you, you hear it all the time when you are getting customer service. Click one or click two about whichever your issue is going to be. You'll probably talk to a bot well before you get to a person assuming you ever get there. But I will say a lot of companies... Um, recognize that people do, do still want to hear a voice though. They do still want to hear a person. You and can so, hear that with AI? No, no, because you know it's it can a bot. sound just like you're talking to me. But, can... but they know it's a bot. They <laughs> I don't mean, know? Yes, I, think, I do think, well, at least for me, when I call various customer service, and again, I know that it's, it's not a real person. I know it's a bot. I know, I know it's a machine. I know it's AI. It is what it is. And and it's, it's funny when we're seeing, because I think, some of these political parties, but um, particularly Trump, but his, his surrogates, you see them use AI to show bigger crowd sizes or to show Trump rescuing people in the hurricane or to show the little baby with her puppy dog. I mean, this is all AI. And, and the one being I'm eaten away. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Just go show yourself. But to some degree, we are also trying to train people to understand the difference because there is also that danger of. Again, you have bots getting your email saying you owe money. You have bots sending things on your behalf that wasn't sent, that you did not send. So, I mean, I guess you have the hackers. And so there, there are still um, issues there. And because there are issues, people are getting trained on how to spot what is AI and what isn't. So I do think eventually, <laughs> I mean, again, I think their companies are clearly embracing AI. And I hear what you're saying. It is, it is not only convenient in terms of your, your pocketbook, but it's also helping you ensure that every call gets answered. Every appointment gets booked. You are not missing out on any client or patient. <laughs> Sign <laughs> me <come> up. <laughs> Sign, I'm telling you now, if you've got that product available right now, sign me up because I am so tired at this point of having patients call me and say, uh, or hear patients, I, I could never get in touch with anybody at your office. And the technology is advancing so much now that it, we already know where it is right now. So you can have, um, I had a guy who was, doing some work for me before. He's like, I can clone your voice, you know, do voiceover. I can clone your voice. It didn't sound like me. He provided an <laughs> AI version of me, but he basically typed in what he wanted to say. And it sounded very much like a real human. And so there's a lot of times these AIs, they respond so quickly and are so knowledgeable that you may not know that you're talking to a bot. If you can tell it today, you can rest assured in about three years, the technology will be so good that you won't be able to tell whether you're talking to a human or a bot, except for the fact that they never say a bot will probably say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, if you're, and if you're Trump, you probably still won't say, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's why I said the training, because I mean, this isn't really anything new. I mean, when we became even more industrialized with machines and stuff, we, we saw the labor force drop drastically once machines came in. Um, but subsequently though, if that machine goes down, this massive products that you were sending out also goes down. You yeah. know? Um, and we also see oftentimes again with that Chevron with, with the decrease in regulations of the like, then we're, we're not only then taking out some of that human element to ensure, okay, are we making sure that one, you know, all the products are are correctly assembled. There's no hazardous because, you know, we've got the bio lab here. I'm still curious as to how that happened, but it's just a massive leak of chemicals. When we're decreasing in that, then we are then using AI to even, I don't know, to like make the product. 
And, I, and to some degree, that could be dangerous because again, these products are, these machines don't, don't know, at least you can tell me if it's true or not, but the, the machines are doctors. So they don't know what affects the body, you know, wrong. I mean, there's a reason why Epstestos was became such an issue. <laughs> we we have to know if certain things are still and, and with boar's head. That's the reason why they're in trouble. You've contaminated this meat that has gone out all over the all over the country because you've relied on machinery and the like to do it. And now we have a problem with this deli meat that a lot of people have consumed. Yeah. And you know what? Those same things happen when humans were involved with it. <laughs> <laughs> but so not, you, as, not, as fre not as frequently because you weren't producing as much. So you could catch it quicker. Right. So the percentage. So then, of course, you'd start looking at, from an economic standpoint and a, and a productivity and a production standpoint, you start looking at the scale, uh, the scale of production. If you can increase the scale of production without increasing the frequency or the percentage or the frequency of errors, or if you can decrease the frequency of errors, then it creates an opportunity for more technology, more technological advancement. I envision a time when, when most of what we do will be done by robots. And in that case, it will be done by computers and AI. A guy came to my office yesterday and presented to me an option. He says, you turn it, when you walk into the room, you just start having a conversation with the patient. And the microphone is picking up everything that's being said there. And you ask this patient a series of questions. It doesn't matter how irrelevant or relevant they may be. Because patients will sometimes ramble on about their medical problems and tell you needless stories. And at the end of it, you press a button. It'll show you the transcript of everything that was said. And then you tell it to convert it to a note. And it writes the most ele elegant uh <laughs> and professional history of present illness that you'll ever want to see that it captured every one of the symptoms that the patient had and attributed it to whatever the problem was and put in a very succinct and intelligible form better than even I can do. And I'm sitting here thinking like this beats any one of my notes anytime. And it's, and I've got, <laughs> I've got some, uh, I've had some mid-levels and other people who come to my office throughout the period of time. And I'm like, I don't like your note. You know, it's got a whole bunch of stuff in it that doesn't need to be in there. But I don't have that problem with AI because it knows exactly how to write the note. And you're like, man, I could have done a better job myself. And so when that, when you keep getting that type of reinforcement, we eventually will start adapting it because we're like, this is less errors than I had when I had humans doing it. This was more accurate than when I had humans doing it. It's just a matter of teaching the computer to do it. And the computer will learn a lot faster than a 60-year-old or 55-year-old uh, man or woman. Can't touch the sore spot and see your patient flinch. It can't. It can't, it can't do that. And, and I mean, do you want, and, and, and I'm not, I, I do think it's good. Don't get me wrong. I just don't think you. Sh it, it should deplete to totally the human experience. Because again, when we talk about farmers, would you prefer your orange to be artificially generated or would you prefer the freshness of the soil? <laughs> you know, you, you have this to- one, Which one is better for me? <laughs> well, if even as a doctor, isn't one better for you in, in terms of your health than the other? And so- If you can genetically engineer an orange that is healthier for me and keep me alive longer, <laughs> then I'll take the you genetically can, engineered one. But I mean- Otherwise, the farmers are good <laughs> because we already see that the the agriculture image um, industry is slimming down. We, I mean, we already see that the genetic hormones that they're putting in the chickens <laughs> and and all this is, is happening. But we also see that there are some harms in all that. There's there's a reason why people do say, oh, it doesn't have to do with the GNOs or whatever, um, in in there because there is harm in in these machine type AIs making your food. Yeah, I just think that as AI uh, progresses and fewer and fewer tasks need to be done by humans, we're going to have more humans unemployed. And I think then we need to begin to transition more toward a socialistic society. Grant, you're not doing all this work that you were doing before. Why can't you now be a little bit more altruistic? Why is it then? And this is going to sound horrible. It's capitalist. Just, That's why. Exactly. We're capitalist. Exactly. The, the reality is, is if you can't work, 
if you can't work because AI has now taken over every other job and bots are doing Although every you job. You just need a whole thing. synopsis of all the stuff you could do on your own. Be an influencer. Go drive Uber. <laughs> but listen, Elon Musk this past week uh, introduced his driverless taxis. You know, <laughs> just like soon, soon you won't even be able to do Uber anymore because the Uber vehicles are going to be autonomous. And who's going to get the money from that? The bourgeoisie will get the money from that. And who's going to be left out of a job and who's going to be left unemployed? The proletariat will. And as a result, when you when you get desperate enough, just like these migrants who are crossing, you know, five countries to get to the U.S. on the hope that they might be able to sneak in and not get returned. Why are they doing that? Because they are desperate to provide for their families. And if capitalism continues on this path of saying, hey, we're going to make sure that the bourgeoisie is, is taken care of and the proletariat, good luck to you. There's going to be a revolt. There's going to be an increase in a rise in crime. And so I think as technology advances, it's going to push us closer toward either a civil revolt or moving more towards socialism. So yeah, can you, imba can you imagine a society where people barely have to work because AI is doing everything. So who's going to bit benefit from it? If AI is doing 70% of the work or 40% of the work, then that's 40% of the workforce laid off. What are they going to do? Well, and, and I know we're running out of time, but I, I, I would also, because I don't disagree with you. I just think that the consumers will still demand a human face because they do it and when they call customer service. A lot of people will push that zero because they're like, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to talk to a person. You see it also in the grocery line. People prefer to have someone actually check them out versus go to their self-checkout. Um, I mean, even when you're talking about like interior design, or you're talking about stylists or whatever, people still want to have someone personally there picking out their clothes and showing them versus hit, hitting a bot on a, on, on a robot and saying, go forth and be great. I just think there, it, the consumers will still demand to some degree, some human interaction, but I don't disagree that again, AI is going to, just like they, just like the machine industry is going to predominate potential, um, potentially or, or specifically lower entry jobs. I, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you to, a, to, a, to an extent. And, and that is that I think people demand a human, one, that is competent, and two, that you're is compassionate. Know that. <laughs> you're not going to know that because you're you not going to know if they're coming, but, but the compassion you, element definitely agree. Yeah, competent <laughs> and compassionate. And frankly, I would take competent over compassionate before because there's nothing more frustrating than to be able to, 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 to wait and, and deal with somebody who can't handle your issue. But you have um, to keep in mind, by the time you are spitting out an issue, talking to the customer service, it means that you've probably exhausted the AI elements already. And so you want to talk to someone. Um, and I agree, you, you want them to be competent, but at the same time, you really want them to, to personally put in and change the information or, or reprogram the robot <laughs> that is getting you the need that you need. Um, because the robot isn't going to change the mind. And so until people get better, until people receive better service from an AI bot, <laughs> they, when, when they start when they start receiving better service from an AI bot, guarantee you they were like, give me the AI bot. Because I'm sitting, listen, I love my employees. I love my employees. But I still, on a daily basis, see names misspelled. I see you know, somebody booked on a schedule that shouldn't be booked in that certain particular time point. Humans make errors. But you're Computers from make the errors. Side. Speak from uh -huh. the, you're speaking from the employer side. Because I agree, the employer loves it, embrace it. But from the consumer side, from the I consumer don't side, embracing it as much as you, you like to the, think that they are. From the <laughs> consumer side, I guarantee you, people like to, when they call the office, get a response right then and there. They don't want to have to be put on hold. They don't want to be called back Wish and everything else. Wish you put on like hold that. with the AI box. <laughs> you no, know? no, you won't. You put on hold. Again, right. because what, by the time they're calling, because that's why I say in this day and age, by the time you are calling, you have already gone to the website. And if you couldn't do what you need to do there, you've already 
um, probably checked in with the machine and if they didn't help you, you want a person. I don't know. You're frustrated at that point by the time you're calling. And you so want you a knowledgeable and competent person. <laughs> I'm not disputing. I mean, again, don't just hire someone right. off the street. You're going to have to train them on to some degree. But there's not a, another person that will be more knowledgeable than that computer. Because in that in that instant, that computer can search entire databases. From I the put employer's my, perspective, yes. Not from I, the consumer's from perspective. From the consumer's perspective. Listen, I put my entire book into AI and asked it to read it and provide a synopsis for me. And in a matter of 30 seconds, 40 seconds. It read my entire manuscript. But you are coming from the perspective of you know exactly okay. what you need. The let me, consumer let me. does not know. And so the consumer is just like, uh, I have a symptom. And then the AI is going to be like, okay. And what is your symptom? <laughs> and and then, that's not a symptom. But then that's, but you know as well as I do, one symptom could actually be a, a bigger issue that could surface somewhere else. And so to that's what I'm saying. If you want people to rely on WebMD, they can. But now, would you really think WebMD is a sufficient doctor? I think I think you are underestimating the power of AI, <laughs> and and not maybe maybe not so much today. But I think you're underestimating where AI is going to be in short in a short term. I mean, in a matter of two three years. I'm not an level of AI from a legal standpoint. Yeah, I could type in all kind of things, and it will come out a, a brief. But I can also tell you, if you don't have a person checking those uh, court Absolutely. cases, then that's a problem. If you don't have a person who, again, knows that, hey, yes, it may spit one issue, but it could also be this issue or it could also be this. And I mean, that's then where so I'm saying that it's the combination of the two. I would not recommend someone using AI as their lawyer. Zoom, legal Zoom is out there <laughs> and, and then people do use it. But again, you you miss out on some of the intricacies that certain businesses would probably want in their contracts that is not automatically generated from a form right. contract. Right. And I would imagine that's the same in your business. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What I'm just saying, I'm not, I don't think that they're going to replace 90%. That's why <laughs> I backed all the way down to about 40%. But I do That's think that the entry level, definitely the entry I level think, definitely. Yeah, I think AI today is at the point where it could probably do 40% of our work <laughs> and can probably do it more consistently and better than humans can. If they have the knowledgeable person inputting the information. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, you have to know how to what search um engines to put in. Like you and, can't do any do anything and it comes out what you need. Yeah, I think from with dealing with our topic again today, back to, to to the economy and economic systems, I think we're going to have to reevaluate how we operate capitalism, how capitalism functions as AI takes over more. Because uh, we are, if we don't become more altruistic society, more socialistic society, we're going to be, we're going to have a lot of people who are unemployed, unable to care for their families, and they're going to be doing the desperate things that these migrants are doing. We have to move more toward a socialistic and altruistic perspective as it, as it relates to caring for people around us. And if that is not a Kamala endorsement, I don't know what they what is. <laughs> ah, 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 amen. Amen. <laughs> Definitely, you guys tell us what you think um, on, on this topic, and I'm sure it's something we'll bring up again. Um, but in the meantime, hopefully you've been listening to some of the previous topics that we've had, but also catch us on your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to catch a repeat of this episode on Star Radio, and you can also watch it again on YouTube. So until next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, have a blessed week.